When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When I started living broke on purpose, I had money, but I didn't have enough money to do the things that I wanted to do, like, you know, like those wants, because I was being very intentional about where my money was going. So because I didn't have enough money to do the things I wanted to do, I was broke, but it was on purpose. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. Welcome back to the show, ETMers. It is so good to have you here. Okay, I want you to raise your hand if you've ever said these words. I'm broke. I know I've probably said it, thousands of times. And we throw the word broke around almost as much as we do as one of my other least favorite words, I'm fine. Why do we always answer I'm fine when we know we're not fine? I digress. What does broke actually mean though? What does it mean to be broke? My guess is that it means a little something different for all of us. As our guest, Dr. Melody Wright, founder of Broke on Purpose and Kinley's director of financial education says, there's a difference between being aimlessly broke and broke on purpose. Broke on purpose is a choice you make proactively to help you do all sorts of things, pay off debt, buy that house you've been saving for, or really any other money goal that means something to you. It's a choice. And Melody has helped thousands of people stop being aimlessly broke and transform their mindset, behaviors, and practices related to money. And she's here to do the same thing for you in this thought-provoking episode. I'll let Melody show you the way. Let's start talking. We're talking about this idea of being aimlessly broke, which really caught, caught my attention. I think that, you know, so many of us just have little or maybe no direction with our money. And I know I have been there so many times. I know you share the same story, which is why we're kind of talking about this idea. But just to start us off, you know, how do we recognize if we're currently in this aimlessly broke category? That is an excellent question. And, you know, I came up with this whole concept of being aimlessly broke because my brand is called Broke on Purpose, right? And so typically when you hear somebody describe 
themselves as being broke, it means that they're, they just don't have enough money to do the things that they want to do. Like there is a difference between being broke and then being in poverty, right? I just want to make that, that declaration. There's a difference between those two. And so, um, when I started living broke on purpose, I had money, but I didn't have enough money to do the things that I wanted to do. Like, you know, like those wants, because I was being very intentional about where my money was going going. So because I didn't have enough money to do the things I wanted to do, I was broke, but it was on purpose, right? And so when you think about that and people who are quote unquote aimlessly broke, they are broke for no reason. They they can't tell you why they're broke. They have no rationale for why they're broke. They can't show you why they're broke. They're just aimlessly broke. Like you're just wandering out here and you just are broke, right? And so right. it it really came from the mindset of just like, if you are going to be broke, if that is going to be your situation, you should be broke on purpose rather than being aimlessly broke because you have nothing to show for your brokenness. So tell me a little bit about like the idea of intentionality, because as you're talking, this is kind of coming up for me of, you know, I feel like a lot of us just kind of move through the world, we spend money, and you and I both know that most people don't know exactly how much we spend on anything. And so, you know, I always talk about this idea of bringing some intentionality to to your spending. Tell me a little bit about the role you see intentionality playing. Intentionality it's just so important, not within your financial life, but in like all other aspects of your life as, as well. Because when you're intentional about something, it means that you have honed in, you know what the result you want to get out of it is, and you know the things that you need to do in order to make this happen. And so when you're intentional about your finances, you are being cognizant of the money that is coming into your life and then what exactly you want that money to be able to do for you. Because what I think a lot of people don't realize is that, yes, you go out and earn money, but you have power over your money. You own that money. You have the ability to tell that money what to do. Because if you don't tell the money what to do, even though it's not like a living, breathing thing, we all see money slip through our fingers. We're spending it. We, Like you just said, we don't typically know like what we're spending it on or how much we're spending because there's not that intentionality behind how you are using the money. So for example, when I first discovered that I had $212,000 of debt that did not include my mortgage, that all came from me or my family not being intentional about how we were using our money. Yeah, we were using it to pay for our day-to-day expenses like our rent or our mortgage at the time, um, maybe paying some credit card bills or car payments. We were using it in that aspect to just pay those bills, but we weren't really thinking about what else could this money do for us if we really sat down and made a plan for it. And so when you think about intentionality around your money, how are you going to use that money that is coming into your life? That dollar, that $5, that $10, that 50 cents, how are you going to use it to do the things that you have said that you wanted to do? So it's really being intentional about digging in, creating a plan, and then having steps so you can see that plan through. That's to me, is where the intentionality comes from. Yeah, you said so many amazing things just there, but I love you talking about the the power that we can give our money when we're we have this kind of awareness of where my money is going and how we're using it and how we're using it, I think, to really craft the vision that we want for our lives versus following maybe what other people are doing. There were so many gold moments in what you just said. And I want to get to some practical steps about how we get out of this place. But before we do it, I'm curious, you know, why why does this happen? Like, why do we end up in this place where uh, we're just spending money, we're being kind of aimlessly broke, and we know it's not where we want to stay, but we just kind of get stuck in this place. Why do you think that happens? You know, I think it happens because there is a lack of financial education 
And then with the lack of financial education, there comes a lack of financial literacy. And so when you when you think about financial literacy and financial education, you hear a lot of people say we have to have these financial literacy initiatives. You have to have financial literacy this. We need financial literacy that. But let's break down what financial literacy means. Financial literacy means the yeah. understanding of personal finance tenants. It means you understand it, right? And then understanding is relative. You have to have some way to measure somebody's understanding. And that comes from testing their financial capability. But when you back that all the way up, what you need is financial education. You need somebody to teach you how to use money properly or how to use money in a way that's going to help you create the life that you want to live. And so you'll hear me say that a lot because I'm so big on empowering people to be able to create the life that they want to live. I call it a designer life without designer labels because you are designing (laughs) the life that you want to live. And it's so empowering to people to tell them that, you know what, you have that ability. You just need to know how to use money to help you be able to do that, right? And so Financial education. You know, the United States ranks 14th globally when it comes to financial education. We know that it's which it's is crazy, cr- right? I mean, why is this <laughs> happening? We could spend all day talking about. I know why this is happening. It blows my mind for us to be in this position where we are within the world that we don't take financial education seriously. Yes, there is a huge push now to get more financial education in schools. You you are starting to see that um, more states are requiring a financial education curriculum to be taught in high schools. But then what you also have to remember is that even though there is a requirement or they're going to put curriculums in schools to be taught around financial education, some of these schools are doing it in such a way where it's an elective, where you can just choose to take it, or it's being partnered with um, another type of elective. So you could be taking home, I don't even know if they teach home ec, right? So I'm just going to say this and I'm, I'm dating myself <laughs> when I say home ec. <laughs> but you could be taking, like, so you'd be taking an economics course and then you could also be doing a financial education course at the same time, right? So it's not like there's these like from um, freshman year to senior year financial education courses that you should be taking, which there should be. And because uh, there is this lack of financial education being in school, the onus is on the individual, the onus is on the family, the onus is on the state and, and local entities to try to make sure that people are taught financial education. And I think because there is not enough done from the start when we are children, we are young, and when our minds are so malleable to the different things that we can learn to really be taught about financial education, where we grow up to be financially illiterate adults. And when we become financially illiterate adults, we unfortunately have children. And because we don't know what to teach them or pass down, they grow up to be financially illiterate adults also. And so the cycle continues, right? And so I think there is this concept of people being aimlessly broke because there has not been enough education, intentional and purposeful education around teaching people how to use money in a way that makes sense for them. Yes, I know the Pythagorean theorem, but do I know how to create a budget that's realistic? Do I know how to go out there and open a savings account that's going to actually earn me more money, right? Do I understand what investing means? Do I understand what dollar cost averaging means? All these things are really important to our financial livelihoods, but we aren't taught that unless we go out and seek the information or somebody says, you know what, people need this, so I'm going to provide it to them. And don't you feel like there's another sort of sub level to that? I mean, this is something I'm really passionate about. One of the reasons I do this show and do what I do is even if we talk about financial concepts in this way, there's a there's a level below that, right? A lot of what we're talking about here, which is visioning and mindset and how you think and feel about money and what sort of passed down to you from generations. What are false money beliefs? Like there's all this sort of subcontext around money that we aren't taught. So sometimes I feel like a lot of experts just want to shove another spreadsheet in your face. And yet we still continue this cycle of financially illiterate, you know, money being the number one uh, stressor. Mm -hmm. In, in America, certainly. And, you know, we're not talking about maybe the whole package around money that needs to be talked about. That you're, That is exactly true. Um, and when I was 
working as a financial coach before I came on as director of financial education here at Kinley, um, when I was working with clients, I would let them know up front that we weren't going to do any work regarding numbers, budgeting, you know, investing, anything like that until we sat down and we talked about their money mindset. Because the way you think and feel about money, you're going to carry that with you as you begin to start to create your money habits. So however your mom handled money, you may have saw that growing up and now that's going to be the way you handled money. Maybe you had a experience around money and now you're starting to create this narrative within yourself where you may tell yourself, I'm never going to be good with money. I'm never going to be able to do this. I'm never going to be able to do that. And because you believe that, because you've been telling yourself that for so long, now when you go out to try to do something with your finances, you are unable to because you've created these, you know, the self-doubt and these limiting beliefs around how you can handle money. And so, you know, and financial trauma is real. You know, some people grow up where money is very scarce and some things have happened in their lives surrounding money where they may think that money is bad. And so instead of inviting money into their life, they push it away because they remember all the bad things that happened when money was prevalent in their lives. And so there is a big push now within the financial education and financial professional field for us to have these open and honest dialogues about, you know, your financial wellness, your your money mindset. How do you think about money? Where do your money beliefs come from? Um, and in a podcast episode that I did for my podcast, Mastering Your Money, I actually talk about how I was okay getting into debt because at a very young age, I told myself that I was never going to be unable to afford something as simple as an apple. So a whole experience with an apple shaped my mindset into being like, it's okay to go into debt if that's going to give you access to something. Because an apple was taken away from me at such a young age and I couldn't understand how somebody couldn't afford an apple. And I never wanted to be in that situation. So when you really take the time to, to sit and dig and figure out what happened with me regarding money when I was young. How did my mom or my dad or my sisters, my brothers, uncles and uncle, family members, how did they talk about money? How did they act when money was present? How did they act when money was scarce? What things have I seen other people say or do around money? Those things shape your money script or the way you view money, right? And they play a big role in how we use our money day to day. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T-O-S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. 
but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. So then once you have maybe some of that awareness over, you know, the money stories that were passed down, kind of your own money mindset, how do you then take that information and start using that for real transformation within your life, your finances, all of that? Yeah, good question. And so what I like to do is um, once you really define out your money story, like sit down and you write it out, you go through it and you recognize the things that you say, okay, this happened, but now let me flip the script and create something better from it. So if I pushed away money because I saw money being something bad within my family, then what good things can come from me saving or having money? Right. So you start to create the positive from the negative. And so that's why I call it flipping the script. So if you find yourself having these thoughts around money where you say, I don't deserve to get a raise or I don't deserve to have this much money in my savings account, go through and ask yourself why. Why do you think you don't deserve these things? And then once you start to list out the why, go through, go back through them again and pick out the truths and then pick out the lies. And then once you identify the lies, you turn those lies into truths. I may not be good with money now, or I feel like I'm not good with money, but I know if I continue to read or work with a coach or do this or that, then I will be X, Y, Z in the future, right? So you turn what is a lie, I'm never going to be good with money into a truth. And then you create a plan going forward with doing that. And is it something where you like are doing the exercise of just repeating that over and over again, like maybe every day or a couple of times a day to kind of trick your brain into really believing that? Yeah. Like you, you do have to start to make it that make it where, you know how like we, we tell ourselves like, I'm not going to be good enough or I'm, oh my gosh, I got this opportunity and why did they pick me? And you start to go down the reasons (laughs) of why you're just not the person they should be working with. Like those are the things that are forefront of our mind. And so you have to do the work to make thinking positive a habit. So it's going to be different for everybody. You know, maybe you need an affirmation that you have and on your mirror in your bathroom so you can say it to yourself every single day. I am super huge on affirmations. And once you go through and you take those lies and turn them into truths, those become affirmations. Those become the truths that you want to tell yourself. I am a lender and I'm not a borrower. I am a money magnet. I have I'm a money magnet on my phone right now because I never want to be in a position where I feel like I'm not going to be able to earn money. Um, and, and that was important for me because I was an entrepreneur. And we know most entrepreneurs, you you got to go out here. And if you don't make any money, you're not going to be able to eat. So I had to get out. <laughs> 
I know that well. I've been one my entire right. career. So, so yes. <laughs> when I first started being an entrepreneur, you know, and I was a financial coach and I had walked away from the bench and I was no longer earning money from being a scientist, it was like, all right, this is all on you. And there were times when I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to make any money. I'm not going to be able to. And I would spiral, like you would go down the spiral of like, why you just aren't great. And so I had to tell myself, no, you are a money magnet. And so opportunities are going to come to you. They are going to be available. You are going to be able to afford the life that you want to live. And I had to believe it. And so I keep that on my phone cover because you, I just want to always see that. You know what? I'm a money magnet. I can do this. I can do that, right? And so those affirmations, once you begin to tell them to yourself, not only just speak them, but you have to believe them. Once you speak them and then begin to believe them, they'll begin to push those doubts and those negative that negative self-talk to the back to where it can never get to the forefront of your mind. And if it does escape to the forefront, you have positive habits that, that are kind of like your immune system, the white blood cells, they're coming in yeah, <laughs> and they're yeah. getting rid of it. Right now, we're going to claim this, right? <laughs> we're all going to be money magnets. I love that one. I, I, I Tell me a little bit more about your story because you've got a really interesting money story. I know you you mentioned you were a PhD trained. Am I going to get this right? Let's see. Parasitologist? Yes, parasitologist. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. All right. I've never heard about that. So got to know what that is. But then you, you made a pivot into being a financial empowerment coach and you started this on your your debt free journey in in 2015 and you know you and your husband you said you really realized that you were just like one emergency away from bankruptcy mm-hmm. you mentioned already you had about $212,000 in debt which is a lot but is a relatable to so many of us listening so i got to know like tell me a little bit more about this story and your journey from from science into financial empowerment yeah it's kind of a it's kind of a I don't want to say it was an, an unexpected transition because I've always been into finances, but never as much as I am now. Um, so I was getting my PhD at the time. I was at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I was working in a parasitology lab, and my project dealt with malaria, um, which is, yeah, wow. so I was working on malaria, and I was trying to deduce like how it moved inside the red blood cell and doing all this research on that. Um, and my, my PI came to me at the time, and this is my I met my mentor and I was working in his lab and he said, hey, you know, you're going to graduate at the end of the year. And I was like, really? Because what's different with a a parasitology PhD is that it is known that it takes us a lot longer to graduate because of the nature of our projects. And so while some people in in different areas of microbiology, immunology, they were graduating within four years, it was going to take us at least, you know, six and a half, seven. That was known. So this was around like year three or four when he came in and told me that I was going to be graduating early. And I was like, are you sure you think I'm ready? And he was like, yeah, you're ready. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. But I really think he was just wanting to retire early. So so I was just going to go for it, right? Um, so he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're good. You're, you're good. Ready. You figured it out. You'll figure it out. So um, after that, I went home and I was like, okay, well, if I'm re- if I'm going to graduate early, then there's a couple of things that are going to happen. A chain of events are going to happen. I'm going to graduate and I'm either going to ha- get a postdoc or I'm going to get a job in industry and everything's going to be good or I'm going to graduate and my student loans are going to kick back in and I have not found a job or anything like that. Like I'm still searching or I'm going to grad. Like I was listing all these different things that can happen. And I was like, well, let me see what's going on with our finances so that I can start to like make sure that things are paid off. You know, we're in a situation where when I graduate, it's not this outstanding debt that's just sitting here because technically I've lost my paychecks. And we were actually getting paid to go to school at the time. So that's a big thing to call it also. In my PhD program, they actually paid us to um, do research wow, and go to yeah. school. Um, wasn't much, but we did get paid. <laughs> um, so, you know, I sat down and I pulled up, you know, all the debts and I was calculating everything. And I saw this number on the calculator and it was $212,000. Now, mind you, I'm like, okay, no, I had to like add something. I divided, I multiplied <laughs> somewhere. Like, this is not right. right. There there's there's something no way there, we yeah. have this much debt, right? And so I go back and I calculate it again, and it's still $212,000. Now, mind you, I had not added in our mortgage, which was around that time, probably another like $150,000. Had not added that in. So we had $212,000 of debt that did not include our mortgage. 
So you can imagine the feelings and the emotions that I had at that time. I'm pretty sure I probably went through like the seven stages of grief, but it was like all related to like (laughs) (laughs) finances. So I was in denial. I was angry. I was upset. I was like blaming others. You know, I was just like, this, this can't be real. And on top of that, like I had to like tell my husband about it. Like, this is me sitting here calculating it myself. So I had not told my husband about it. And I didn't tell my husband. I said, let me see if I can figure out how to quote unquote fix this, right? So I knew about like debt consolidations and I knew about like balance transfers. And I was like, I knew about you can get loans and consolidate debt. So I was like, let me go to the bank and ask them if I can get a personal loan, right? Because if I do that, we consolidate it into one loan. It's one monthly payment. Interest rates are lower. Maybe that would be more feasible and and what won't have me sitting here paralyzed. So I go to the <laughs> bank. And to be honest with you, like I, this was honestly my only option because I couldn't tell my parents. Right, right. I couldn't tell, I couldn't, I couldn't ask anybody for money. Like they wouldn't be able to give us money. And I didn't want to feel like a failure or like tell anybody the truth. So I'm like, all right, this, this has got to work. So I go to Wells Fargo and I asked to speak to one of the loan managers. And I remember sitting in his office and he's on his computer. His back is turned to me because he's like inputting everything. And I'm looking around the room and I'm like, okay, like I've got to get this loan. How do I get this loan? So I'm like, I'm going to make small talk. So I'm like commenting on his pictures. I'm like, oh, are those your kids? Oh my gosh, they're so, you know, I'm like, oh, did you, oh, you went here? I mean, we're having a great conversation. I'm like, yes, I got it. It's in the bag, right? He, How could he deny yeah, me? Like, yeah, I'm amazing. It. So right. he turns around. And he says, Miss Wright, um, it says here the bank will be in touch. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future, too, and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance, so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams Visit sandyspringbank.com slash wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. Now, you know, anytime you apply for a credit card right. or a loan or anything and they say somebody will be in touch or they're going to send you a letter, means that means no. you were denied. <laughs> like you did not get it, right? Right. So I'm like, try again. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> you know, so I'm walking out of the bank and I felt like I had a big scarlet letter on my forehead and it was an A, it was an F for failure. Um, and I'm driving in the car home and I'm like, that was it. That was my, that was my only option. What am I going to do? And not only that, I have mm. to tell my husband, I have to tell my husband about this. Right. Dun, dun, right. Dun. So <laughs> I go home and I think it took me a couple of days to work up like how I was going to tell my husband. I was like, do I cook him a really nice meal? Like, you know, in the middle of like him being like eating like his favorite food. I'd be like, oh, yeah, by the way, we have two hundred and twelve thousand dollars in debt. Like, you know, I'm like, let me just slide that one in. (laughs) You know, I'm like, do I give him a massage? Like, how do I like just drop this bomb on him? And I think I just walked in his office and I was like, "Um, so listen, I did the numbers. We have this much debt. Yada, yada, yada. Don't worry because I have a plan. Now, why did I tell him that? I had no plan, right? <laughs> but I was plan. like, Zero plan. and I just, I just wanted it to, I, I guess I wanted to feel like I was in control or in control of the situation. So I was like lying to myself about it. But he was very calm. Right. He was like, okay, you have a plan. I was like, yeah, I got a plan. I, I got this. <laughs> um, no plan. No clue what I was going to do. Did he ask you what the plan no, is? No, he, didn't, he didn't ask me what the plan okay, was. Good, Thank good. God, because I wouldn't have been able to tell him. Right. But I realized at that point, Wells, if Wells Fargo was not going to help me with the personal loan, then it, it was basically on me to figure this thing out. And so what I did was I dove into any and everything personal finances. Like I let my scientific critical thinking brain take over and I just started accumulating as much information as possible. And then I was like, how do I take this information and turn it into something that is useful for my family? Because there's a lot of information out there, right? And you got to weed through it and you got to figure out what's going to work for you and what's not going to work for you. What makes sense? What doesn't make sense for your, your particular situation? And in doing that, I created what I currently call the money management system. 
And the money management system is my intentional way of how money comes into my life and then flows and then flows into different areas of our financial livelihood. So into our essential expenses, into our non-essential expenses, into our savings and investing, into our debt pay down and using that money management system and getting very intentional about where every single dollar was going. We were able to pay off over one hundred thousand dollars in less than three years. Wow. And so it really, That's thank you so much. It really got to the point where I realized that nobody was going to save me. Like the, the, the got loan officer in Bank of, uh, I'm sorry, at Wells Fargo didn't even offer, hey, we have some financial education or we have these resources for you to use so you can create a debt payment strategy for you to do this, for you to do that. I was offered nothing. And so the onus was on me as the individual to figure it out. And so I had to go figure it out. And I realized that there are a lot of people out here who are in a similar situation as me, who are just trying to figure it out or they're looking for answers or for somebody to help them. And I could be at that bench all day trying to find a cure for malaria, trying to stop malaria from being able to invade the red blood cell. I could do that. But did that help my community? Did that help people to be able to wake up and not feel stressed or anxiety around their money? To me, it didn't. And so I realized that I was purposed I had to go through what I had to go through so that I could realize that this is why I was put on this earth to help people figure out how to manage their money, to help them stop being aimlessly broke and create money management systems that were going to help them to live the life that they desired. And so I walked away from the bench in 2000. 19. I'm sorry. Two, yeah. Around 2019, I left science altogether. I left science altogether and I decided to take broke on purpose full time, which is the name of the, my financial empowerment company. Probably a good time to leave science too, right? 2019? <laughs> well, well, it was right before, it was right before, you know, the whole world decided to do whatever it was yes. going to do, right? And that, I, and I, that would have been, I, I always find it, I always ask myself, like, I wonder what it would have been like if, like, I was still there and, like, all that would have happened. But then, I mean, I realized that, you know, walking away and giving yourself permission to walk away so that you can help people better their lives like that in itself is just a testament yes. to just saying like it financial education and financial literacy and helping people to realize their ability is is so much bigger than me you know it's so much bigger than and than anything that's out here because once people have financial control there's no limit to the things that they can do and that's something I want people to really, truly understand. Once you learn how to manage your money in the way that makes sense for you, not in the way I tell you to do it, not in the way that another guru tells you to do it or another expert tells you to do it, and the way that makes sense for you, you unlock so many opportunities and doors for you. You have a life with options. And a life with options allows you to do so much more than a life where you're limited by the amount of money in your bank account. Ooh, I love that. I just got chills. That's why I do what I do too. So I'm glad that there's somebody else out there um, empowering people in, in the same way and empowering people to make personal choices that feel right for them in their life. Um, I, I was doing a little research on you before we had this conversation. I read an article where you were featured on Grow and you talked about how your debt numbers were going down, but your mental health was suffering oh, and you man. really needed to kind of reevaluate <laughs> the plan. And I think those are really interesting um, parallels, I guess, that so many of us can relate to. I mean, on one hand, you're thinking, my debt's going down. Like, why am I not feeling fantastic? But again, we talk about that other piece that goes along when we talk about money and the mental health side of things. So tell me about you know, reevaluating, like, what did that look like for both your your debt, a payoff and, you know, mental health? Because I would imagine there's somebody listening that feels that same way right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. This is the thing that we really don't talk about. And so when I when I first started my debt payoff journey, I actually started an Instagram called It's Broke on Purpose, you know, um, the name of my company. And I would share debt payoff reports. And I would be like, hey, this month, we knocked out $5,000 of our debt. And I would talk about all the different ways we would do it. And I I would be like, yeah, rah, rah, sis, sis, swoon, bah, like whatever, like this is super exciting. And then after I would post, I would sit on the couch and I would just be like, oh my God, I'm so tired. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm drained. Right. I'm mentally like, I, I would just be exhausted because in my mind, it was pay off the debt, get the debt down by 
any means necessary. So that meant that I was working full time, you know, in the lab as a PhD student. And we didn't work 40 hours a week. We worked probably like 80, 90 hours a week. Like I would be going in oh like in the gosh. middle of the evening, two, three o'clock in the morning to do experiments. Right. So I was doing that. And I was also an influencer on the side. You know, this is probably maybe still the beginning stages of the influencership, but I was an influencer and I was a beauty and lifestyle influencer. I'm not going to tell you all the names, so bonus points if you actually find out what that site is. <laughs> Ooh, so, all right, we're going to do some so digging. I was a beauty and lifestyle influencer. And so I was taking any and every opportunity that was coming my way. And I would take that money and I would just pay taxes, you know, out of what I, whatever I needed to pay in taxes and the rest would go towards debt. Right. So All the money that was coming into our life was going towards debt. And we didn't get to enjoy any of it because we had created this super strict budget that I do not recommend anybody else do because we were so focused on paying down as much debt as possible. I would set these audacious goals and I'd be like, we have to hit them, right? So I would be driven towards hitting those goals. But when I looked back at it all, I realized how much of my life I missed out on. Like I stopped investing because I was focused on paying down debt. Huge mistake, huge mistake, you know, because I missed out on all the returns that I could have had if I would have just said, you know what, I'm just going to put $100 towards investing and put the rest towards debt or $100 towards my retirement and put the rest towards debt. I missed out on going to see family for certain events. You know, I missed out on being able to participate in some things that would just provide me with like mental health and self-care because I was so focused on paying down the debt. And I got to a point when we paid off a huge portion of it where I was like, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. This it, it, It's great, but it yeah, doesn't yeah. make sense and it's not sustainable for me. Maybe for somebody else, but it's not sustainable for me. And this was over the course of almost three years, right? And so what do we do as individuals? We grow. We grow when we start to learn more, we start to realize like different things. And so I realized that my mindset around money was about what can money truly do for me? It can pay down my debt, but that's not the only thing that it can do for me. You know, and once I started to really allow myself to see what money can do for me outside of paying down my debt, going in savings and doing like the the things that we typically hear people telling us we have to do with money, I realized that. Trying to pay off or become debt free was no longer a mission for my household. It, I mean, it was no longer, it was no longer going to be a mission for my household. We were going to be able to live and pay off debt at the same time. We were going to be able to go on vacation and pay off debt at the same time. So we created a life of balance. So how do you balance paying off debt or meeting your financial goals, but then also enjoying the money that you earn because you should enjoy it. You earned it. You worked hard for it. You dealt with those coworkers. You sat in email uh, meetings that could have been emails, right? You did all that. So why not enjoy yes. some of your money? And so I had to, for my mental health, I had to make the choice that we were going to continue to pay down debt but we weren't going to be so, you know, gung ho about it. We weren't going to be so you got to pay down debt. This is the only thing you could do. And so I stopped posting my pay, debt payoff journeys and I let people know, yeah, we're paying off debt, but we're not doing it at this accelerated pace. And so I started to share about the opportunities that paying off that much debt had opened up for me and how, you know, just paying off even a hundred, a thousand dollars, what type of opportunity for living a better life that can open up for you. And so in doing that, you know, we, we're, we've been able to buy another house. You know, we have a pretty healthy emergency fund over six months, but we're still paying down our debt. But we're also using our money in other ways to help us build wealth at the same time. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Like such a interesting story. And I think when we share the stories, we can really relate and we really find ourselves, I believe, in other people sharing their stories, particularly around money, since it's this topic we don't talk about. I've got a couple of more questions for you because this is such great information. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'm wondering, what are you seeing right now as, as some of the common questions or just stumbling blocks that people are having with their money? Are you seeing any patterns that are emerging? You know, most of the patterns I see, I don't think things are changing around like questions that people are asking around money. A lot of people just want to know, like, how do I get started? 
where do I start? Like, how do I start to take control of my money? And I think that is one of the most important questions that we as financial professionals and we as financial educators should be able to answer for people. How do I get started? Where do I start? And I know some people don't like this answer, but it's truly as simple as just starting. And just starting could be, you know, just choosing to change your mind with like how you feel about your money or what you want to do with your money or sitting down and creating, you know, like a a budget, a spending plan, whatever you want to call it, just get started. And I think a lot of things that we see around, you know, a lot of things that I'm starting to see is people, they're looking for ways to start to build wealth immediately. And you got to blame it on social media, you know, because with social media, we see the highlights, we (laughs) see people living, you know, these big and amazing lives, but we don't see what happens in the background. We don't see the hard work that was put in for people to be able to afford these homes or these cars or to live this lavish lifestyle. And we also don't see if they're putting it on their credit card and not being able to afford the minimum payments. Like we don't see that. Right. So I think a lot of people want They want financial freedom. They want to experience financial wellness, but they want to experience it immediately, you know, and I think that there has to be more conversation around this is a process. This is a journey. It does not happen overnight unless you win the lottery, you know, and and then you're able to just pay things off. But it's it doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. And building wealth is a process. So take what is out there, you know, take what you are seeing and hearing and figure out how you can apply that to your your goals or your life plans and things like that. So it's really about how do I start? And that's exactly why I wrote the book called Start Here, Your Guide to Building Your Money Management System, because how do I start and where do I start was the number one question that I was getting as a financial coach from people who would just send me a random message on, you know, Instagram or Facebook or reach out to me on Twitter. They would just want to know, I I want to do this, but I don't know where to start. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a book that tells them exactly where to start, how to do it, and actually how to build their money management system. All right. So, so Melody, as we, as we close out here, we're rounding out the end of the year. And for everyone listening, you know, how do we focus on creating some intentional goals that we can move closer to every day so we can move out of this place of being aimlessly broke? So I think... One of the best ways for you to create intentional goals is to sit down and start to create your designer life. You really got to ask yourself, what do I want my life to look like in a year, in two years, in five years, in 10 years, right? That cliche, what do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to go in five years? Like it's a cliche question, but it's it's such an important question. And when you sit down and, and start to think about it, don't think about it with limits. Don't think about it with, oh, but I can't afford this. Oh, well, I don't have that job yet. Oh, well, I need to be making this. Don't think about it like that. Do not put any limitations on your dreams. These are your dreams and anything and everything can happen in a dream, right? So write it down. And then once you start to create that that goal for yourself or that that life that you want to live, go back then and ask yourself, what do I want my money to be able to do for me? And I'm going to repeat that question again. What do I want my money to be able to do for me? And write down what you want your money to be able to do for you in this season of your life, in the next season of your life. Because once you define what you want your life to look like, and then what you want money to be able to do for you, you can then go back and look and say, do, am I doing the things that are going to help me get to where I want to be? Is my money doing the things that I want it to do? Do I have enough money going in the right places? You're going to be able to discern those things out and then go and make the corrective, um, the corrections that you need to make to help you get there. So that could mean that you probably do need to start being more consistent with creating a budget or a spending plan. Maybe you do need to start setting aside some of your money so you're making sure that you're paying yourself first so that you have money for an emergency fund, you have money for retirement. Maybe you do need to start having conversations with people in your family about how you're spending money. Maybe you start need to start having conversations with yourself about how you're using money or how you're using, viewing money. And maybe it's about now I need to set up a plan for how I want to get that next promotion or how I want to increase my income. So by visualizing what you want in the future, you then go back and are able to come to the present and say, what changes do I need to make now to help me get there? Because sometimes we'll realize that we are, we could say there's a lot of things that are happening, but we are truly the ones getting in our own way. 
You know, it's the way we think, it's the way we handle money, it's our habits. So you'll have to start to create habits and make them stackable. Once you do one thing, make a habit of doing something immediately after that and something immediately after that, because that's how you create those positive habits that promote positive change. And also another way to be intentional is to start talking about money more. Money is becoming less of a taboo subject because of the, the decentralization of education and the you know ability to talk about it on find, um, on social media. But start to find communities where you can have these conversations around money and you can start to look for accountability partners, people who are possibly on the same journey as you that you can share your ups and downs with. You can share you know things that you've learned and you can learn from them at the same time. So really creating intentionality and setting those goals is about where do you want to go? What's happening in my life now that I need to change, correct, update, or remove to help me get there? There were so many gems in this episode, but I think my takeaway is that I'm going to really start refining when and how I use the word broke after listening to Melody. I love that this idea that you can powerfully choose to be broke on purpose for the sole reason of bettering your situation. That broke doesn't have to be a bad word, my friend. It can actually be a choice. If you'd like to learn more about Melody and dig deeper into this topic, you can find her on all socials at Broke on Purpose, her website, livebrokeonpurpose.com. And she's also Kinley's Director of Financial Education. And Kinley is a fintech that is geared towards Black America. She's got all sorts of insights, learnings, teachings. You can find more on Kinley's website as well. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend who you would also love to help stop being aimlessly broke and move towards being broke on purpose. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guest, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. I'll see you back here in a few days to keep talking money.